many of you, I know there's not so many here, but how many of you have ever been involved in testing AI or machine learning products? Just one. Right. The context is that more, as we know, more and more and more things are being done out there uh, using what's called AI and machine learning and all sorts of stuff, neural networks. But they come with rather interesting differences from anything that the rest of you have ever tested in sort of your DevOps type of work or your with waterfall. And what I'm going to do is to take you through some stories, particularly, that illustrate some rather interesting and fairly catastrophic failures um, over the last five, ten years. Just to add to what we heard a couple of sessions ago, that keynote about Columbia and um, uh, the two space shuttles, this problem of senior pressure to keep going. We've seen in the field of AI, aut aut autonomous vehicles, several very interesting and very unfortunate catastrophes where people at the senior level particularly have been pushing and pushing. And we had that terrible incident in Tempe in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, where they were doing some testing and they switched off one of the critical cameras on the car at night time. We've seen several events with the Tesla cars, which have just driven themselves into the, and blown up and killed their drivers. And I'm going to take you through a few of these to learn, to see if we can learn some lessons about the extraordinary difference that you should be being involved with in your companies. A couple of years ago, I was at the similar, same event, but over in York. And <coughs> it was interesting to pose the question, when I posed the question, did any of you guys ever get involved in the formal testing of any of the work done by your data scientists using system by R or SAS, Tableau, and so on. Do any of you get involved in those? Your data scientists aren't trained in the techniques that you are expert in. They hack it together. And one of the examples that came out of that event over lunch was where, rather like that keynote we're talking about critical medical systems, one of the groups of, uh, in, a, in a, some sort of a, I'm not sure it's pharmaceuticals or what sort of company it was, but it was basically doing stuff with life science. And the data scientists came up with this fantastic new set of algorithms that did stuff with data. And they were really happy with it, and they took it to their boss, their CEO, and said, hey, look at this. We can make money out of it. It'll be a fabulous money spinner. And he said, I'm not prepared to do that until it goes to the QA team. And they found, bizarrely, that some, a, a, one of the arithmetical uh, functions that they were doing was to create an average or a mean. And they discovered accidentally that it depended on which, whether you sorted the data or not, as to what value you got. And you got two different values when everybody knows that the average or a set of numbers doesn't matter irrespect of uh, what sequence, and yet they've got some sequence dependency built in. So one lesson to come back with, go back home with, is if you aren't already involved, your t testing teams must get involved in all of the data science activities that your companies are doing. It's absolutely vital. Now I've been involved at the University of Derby teaching there now since 2002. Before that, I had 30 years at Rolls-Royce Aerospace. And I was involved in that sort of space between the, the doing world and the IT world. I suppose you could say a BA, business analyst type of sort of thing. And managing accountant and all sorts of other things. I've seen almost all areas of business. When I came to University of Derby in 2002, to work in the computing uh, department, I eventually started getting involved in things to do with governments, 
governments of IT, corporate governments and things like that. Because it's so important to remember that we need to be asking questions all the time. And when I'm teaching, I never teach answers. I only <coughs> teach students the questions that are relevant in IT. Now, interestingly, and some of the older people here, more experienced people, will know that the questions that are keeping your CIOs awake tonight, and all of you guys, are the same questions fundamentally as have been keeping CIOs awake for the best part of 50 years. There are no new questions, basically, in the world of computing and IT. And so I teach them questions. And what I do when I go to events like this or other uh, events that I speak at, and I'm invited to speak at, I never tell them the great things or the answers. I go with the government's perspective that these are the fundamentals of what you need to be thinking about if you're going to get business value, if you're going to be safe and successful. And that's what I want to do today. We all know how to tr um, test all the sort of traditional types of software, whether it's a waterfall type definitions or whether it's agile, DevOps, whatever. It's all algorithmic, if then else, essentially or where, or <coughs> clauses, and so on. When you get to AI and machine learning, you've got to throw all of that knowledge and experience and practicality out of the window. You cannot put together test harnesses, because that's not how you do it. You've got a bunch of code that essentially is detecting patterns, learning stuff over a period of time. And this has enormous consequence, I think, for the way that we need to be thinking about this stuff called AI and machine learning. So, three topic areas. We know all of that. We're good at that, by and large. And yet, depending on the pressures from above, time pressures to deliver versus quality, as we heard a couple of sessions ago, we know in principle pretty much how to get pretty good software. It gets a little bit complicated if you're now depending on a whole set of different packages and you're trying to bolt them together. It gets complicated. I remember just at south of Derby on the A38 near Burton is the, one of the big distribution warehouses of Argos. About 12, 15 years ago, I can't quite remember when it was, they were building this new huge lights out warehouse with automation from where the lorry drop, uh, ejects the stuff onto the um, <coughs> conveyor belt, goes through and into the warehouse and goes up and is put into the boxes, uh, into the slots in the dark. Four separate systems. They overran their uh, schedule by six months and I gather that the penalties for late delivery were such as to wipe out total bill for the whole electronic project, which was about 20 million, because they could not get any more than three out of the four systems working together at any given time. And it didn't matter, and it changed day by day as to which ones talked and which didn't. <clears throat> but in principle, we know how to solve that sort of problem, those sort of problems, and get most of the defects out, most of the time. And yet, we, you know, we see the sort of thing that happened a few years ago with RBS NatWest and so on, when they kind of had a bit of a mess. Some of you may have lost access to your uh, bank accounts for a little while. But in essence, we can do that. And we can actually automate an awful lot of it, test harnesses and, and test software. And I see downstairs, we can even perhaps bring in some sort of analytics. Maybe you give it a badge of AI to help the testing process. However, all of the AI machine learning and predictive analytics systems are not anything like that. The core software, yeah, people like SAS or the community, open source community who create R and Python and so on, they go through the traditional processes that you guys know to try and get the basic analytic software working. But when your data scientists then take it to do predictive analytics work to learn about, maybe if you're in the insurance industry, what are the patterns of that we have seen in the past and the decisions that humans have made for accepting or rejecting applications for uh, insurance policies or loans or whatever, 
that's when it gets kind of interesting. You're using validated software, but you're just throwing huge amounts of data at it and it's detecting some patterns. Whether you're using regression analysis or whatever, and you may be throwing a thousand columns of uh, data at it in a million rows. And it goes through all of that and kind of works out the correlation between different columns. It'll find patterns, whatever. Other sorts, like machine, uh, like neural networks, they're kind of you're giving them a whole set of test photos, for, for example, for face recognition. And it's trying to find out where are the faces. And eventually, you want to be able to get it to check, ah, that's Richard Sell's face, out of this great thing. So they have to be trained. And the behavior of these AI machine learning systems depend entirely on the data that you throw at them. The training data, and then, yeah, you try and test it out by giving them a set of data that you know the answer, and does it do, does it pick them up correctly? The problem we have is that almost all of the data that we throw at our AI machine learning type algorithms and systems. All of that data is biased in one way or another. You're a big insurance company, you've got 50% market sector, and you've got all of your data for the last six, 12 months. You throw it at it, and yeah, you can possibly use that for the future for that market sector. You might consider that you've got enough market sector to be that you've got demographics across the maybe the whole of the industry that you're interested in. In which case, you may be able to apply though that same machine learned taught system to apply in other fields. Perhaps if you're a five percent market sector, a niche product, your data is niche. And it will not be representative in any way, shape, or form, probably, of the market sector over here. So you have to think very, very carefully. Yeah, as I say, the core algorithms kind of could be uh, done. You know, even for a neural network, you can actually write the code, well, specify the code, and then write the code for a type of neural network node. But you can't then test in the traditional fashion how these neural networks fit together, stuff comes out the bottom end. It's kind of essentially, in, in our traditional terms, it's indeterminate. Training harnesses ain't going to work. A couple of fascinating examples of where this really went bizarrely wrong because of biases. How many of you heard about the Amazon problem with their HR recruiting assistant? Just one. Very briefly. They wanted to mechanize the processing of job applications for particular types of jobs. And they thought, oh, we're into AI. We should be able to use AI to filter out the best applicants. By January 2018, they had discovered to the horror <clears throat> that it was genderist, it was sexist. It would only accept males. Because the 10,000 sets of, app of applications that they process, trained it on, only held males. <laughs> so it learned Amazon does not employ women. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this is where, where the really important part of the story comes. Not that they killed it in January 2018, but before that, they tried to change the algorithms to become non-sexist. You have a learning system which learns from the data. You can only retrain by killing it and then giving new data which has taken the checkbox out of male, female. Well, perhaps. Because in the West, with Caucasians at least, names, Christian, first names, are fairly gender specific. This is not the case in many other cultures. But then we've had a problem there. And then, of course, the third problem is, which they cannot filter out in the application, is the personal statement. But one thing we do know, and many of you involved in processing uh, job applications and so on, knows that there is a, 
at least in the stereotypical form, uh, sense, there are differences in language and vocabulary and concepts that go in a male and a female job uh, jobs, uh, personal statement. And so it, even if you had sort of taken out names and gender, the system would probably still have learned, here is the type of personal statement that we recruit, which equals, oh dear, males. So there was one. And they announced that, interestingly, the week of the 6th, 14th of November last year. The second fascinating one, IBM from 2012, when they won with Watson Cognitive, the Jeopardy game on TV. They thought, what can we do that's good, that's valuable for the world? Well, they came up with the idea of Watson Oncology, an advisor that will help oncology consultants and doctors to diagnose and treat a certain range of cancers. They did this with uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital, one of the leading uh, institutions in the world that was able to do brilliant diagnosis and treatment of cancer. And they fed in phenomenal numbers, all the human knowledge about diagnosis and treatment of cancer. And then with the doctors in Memorial Sloan Kettering, they trained this up so that it was working quite well. And then they thought, what we can now do, we can license it to all the hospitals around the world, in particular in third world countries, and so on and so forth. They discovered, to their horror, that it only worked at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Because only they had that set particular set of uh, protocols and treatments and so on and so forth. The other country, other hospitals in other countries didn't have access to. It was useless. And as a result, IBM, in the week for ending on the 14th of November uh, 2018, made the announcement that they were basically sidelining all of their Watson work, their Watson cognitive AI sort of stuff, and they had just spent 40 billion US dollars buying Red Hat Linux. A change of direction. A huge change of direction. Yes, they're still selling Watson and its elements and so on. But they're now going back to their roots of mainframes and the equivalent running up on Linux. It was a, I mean, in some ways, it's an amazing piece of software. But it's not delivered the promise. Another example, machine learning, the military in America. The various versions of the story is very, very difficult to track down exactly what went on. But basically, they're trying to teach maybe a, a vision system, maybe for a tomahawk or a cruise missile or something, to distinguish between friendly and enemy tanks. And they did exactly how it, the textbook says. You get thousands of photos of the enemy and the uh, friendly tanks. Take out 20% because they're going to be your testing set. And you train it up until it's passing. It may take thousands of, tens of thousands of passes through that library of photos before it's working perfectly. And they got to the stage where they knew that it was doing it right. It passed all the tests with that reserve 20%. What the story doesn't tell us is how they discovered what that AI system had learned. It had not learned anything about tanks. It didn't even recognize, as far as they could determine, that there were any tanks in any of the photos. All they had done was to look at the background, the sand and the blue sky, all the forests. Because no one had thought to make sure that they've got a really good, diverse set of photos. Every single photo for the enemy was one background. Every single photo of the friendly tanks on a, on a different background, but consistently similar. Data was stunningly biased. Fortunately, they did, they did discover this, and then they kind of fixed it. Because now they knew they needed diversity of data. 
And then Joy Bull and Winnie. She was interesting. As you can see, just about, she has a very, very dark face, very, very dark skin. And she was at, I think, MIT, and she wanted to use one of the standard face recognition systems that could see her. And when she walked into the, her office, they would say, hello, Joy. And then she discovered that it couldn't see her, that, that she was there at all. It couldn't even see her as a face. Of course, if she put one of those V for Vendetta white masks on, mm -hmm. it could find her perfectly well. There, there's a face there. And that, the answer for that one is that the standard training soft, uh, set of data for that, for face recognition, is about 100,000 plus photos, which have been collected from somewhere. Unfortunately, the data is slightly biased. 75% plus of all of the photos are white, Caucasian male. Black females down in the two-ish percent on a quite a wide range of color tones. She was dark enough, I like you look over there, madam, it would never see you. And there are many, and even today, the best, top four uh, AI systems, face recognition systems that are around, have this same problem. They're still running off that hugely biased data set of photos. know about autonomous vehicles not being terribly safe at the moment. What was interesting, the thing that really caught my eye on the 14th of November last year, that I was over in Cologne at a conference where I was talking about AI and so on, <coughs> to a group of, I think, CFOs or CIOs up here. And up on Bloomberg, on TV, was John Krafchick, head of Waymo, the Google Cars company, announcing that in his opinion, his experience, fully autonomous cars in all situations are many, many decades away. Now this was interesting because all of the AI or AV <coughs> car companies up till about then were saying, oh, they're going to be here in 2020, 2025. These are failing because they don't have enough data. They're beginning after a huge amount of pressure from a few people, uh, and you can see them active on LinkedIn, are pushing and pushing for these companies to start using simulation rather than just letting people sh drive them. And if you look at some of those um, videos of, hey, look, our Tesla 3 or whatever can drive itself, I've got my hands like that, and you go around a square <laughs> with about two cars on the roads, and no pedestrians. And how many of you got modern cars with all of these clever systems that tell you when pedestrians are there and it's a bit dangerous and it starts bleating at you because it thinks you're getting into a dangerous situation? But the pedestrians the other side of a five foot wide pavement are not interested. It's just, you know, it's kind of distracting and they, if they're that tetchy, that's sad. There's some ethical issues as well. Two pieces of research published two or three years ago. In China, we can detect with 89% oh, accuracy between, detect between people with criminal uh, tendencies and non-criminal tendencies. Or in uh, Canada, using photos off the internet, what, from people, five I think it was, for each person, where they self-declared straight or gay. Pouring it through the system, they can find 91% on males who were with full uh, two positive. There's a problem with 9% false positive, false negative. And women could do only as good as 83%. The question here about the ethics of should, we, should we, we, we be doing these sort of things is interesting in terms of research. The question, thing is, I know, can think of several um, governments who would probably like to have that sort of capability and immigration. This kind of is part of 
it's not part of the testing process, but it's part about thinking about and challenging maybe what some of your company is doing, maybe. One of the things that we're seeing at the moment, whilst AI and machine learning are still in this upward hype cycle, are a lot of business processes. I'm going to Copenhagen, and, no, sorry, um, Oslo in about three, four weeks' time, about process automation and robotics. Lots of AI sort of stuff to try and make, well, at the top level, AI is the stuff that my colleagues across other industries are leaning on me and saying I ought to uh, use. And probably we can get rid of some of those horribly expensive things called people who make mistakes. They're biased. And we can get AI that could be unbiased, allegedly. So we're seeing at the moment an enormous amount of activity going on. I bet none of you are involved in the testing of those systems. Why not? Because the process owners, the data scientists, don't understand what these things are, are or are not capable of properly. They're doing stuff which is, which is as we saw, kind of with Amazon, somewhat untested until they really learn badly that they've got the wrong. Now, if you're in the financial services, fintech, insurance business, and so on, the great tendency is to use these for automating lots of the simple application processes. But there are some very interesting questions about Here is how the new system works. And you can pour 100,000, a million decisions and the data through them over a weekend, roughly, maybe a couple of weekends, to train it up. But remember, it is learning exactly what humans have been doing. And not only that, it is a total black box. It cannot explain why any particular decision has been made. And under the UK Data Protection Act 2018 and the European GDPR, for these sort of decisions which affect an individual named human <coughs> being's um, life, loan decisions, insurance decisions, decisions, and so on, you have to be able to explain how the decision was made. And with a black box, you cannot. With a traditional algorithmic, it's dead easy, ever so simple. You can actually build in a branch here, if you fail, expla explanation one. You failed on this point, you failed on this point. This is now compliant with law, and it's compliant with regulatory processes. The only trouble is, that's, let's be generous, a few weekends worth of work. And it's the system chundering to itself and not causing any human activity, basically. This one, for an interesting sort of compliance-based application with a few tens or hundreds of criteria, might take a year to process, to develop and test and implement. And probably, what, about a million quid? Something like half a million to a million quid, probably. Now, you're a senior business uh, leader. Three weeks and zero, almost zero cost, or a year and half a million. Those are the pressures. That is non-compliant with law, if it's involving PR, personal identifiable information and critical life decisions. That is totally compliant and explains. You cannot have, you know, when I come to them and say, why did you reject it? Someone said, well, the computer cat said. That just doesn't work. It's not legal. So what do we have to do when we're testing AI type systems? Well, we have to use a lot of human oversight. But as we saw at Tempest, even the human oversight gets bored very quickly. 
it's been found that the drivers in these who are sitting there, the shadow drivers, effectively lose situational awareness within about three minutes. And it can take two minutes to recover situational awareness, which is kind of difficult when you've only got about 150 feet before you run over somebody. Simulation, and they're beginning to do more and more of this, because the, some of the leading experts are saying that the auto, auto, autonomous cars, you need about a billion miles or more of driving. And you want to simulate not just ordinary sort of conditions, but all the sort of things that we with human knowledge and understanding. I mean, I was driving along a road in Derby last year, and about 50 to 100 yards ahead of me on this absolute dead straight road, that's near the 30 limit, I saw someone starting to cross the road. It was a lady, and she was on four inch spikes. Now, I know one or two of you here might be quite fun. Enjoy those. However, one of the things we all, some of us know, is that running, on, trying to run on four-inch spikes is probably not the thing you want to do. But she started running. But at 50 meters, 100 meters, I could see that gap under her foot that said spike heels. Running, I'm going to slow down. But that human knowledge that is very difficult to capture into these sorts of simulations. Because we have an astonishing understanding of the world around us, about how things interact, that we ha we ha which is why we have to have so much human oversight of all of this stuff. There was a, an item about <coughs> four years, years ago from IBM with their Watson system going into a insurance company, uh, yes, an insurance company in Japan. And they were teaching how to look at the claims handling. And they were going to eventually get rid of lots and lots and lots of people. But when they first implemented it, they were very sensible and said, every single decision will be checked by a human. The only, very wise. The only problem is, as we know from x-ray checking, humans get bored and make mistakes and don't see what's happening, particularly if you've got one error in a breast cancer um, scan one in every thousand or two thousand. That's probably too far apart for humans to stay concentrated. So <clears throat> this is about the, you know, the data set of standard photos of faces. You need to get many, 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 many more of particular types of ethnic groups and gender. The other thing you need to be thinking about as you look at the results from the sort of uh, AI predictive analytics systems is <clears throat> the, the actual statistics of what's going on. You see, if you look at something analyzing, I don't know, sentiment analysis from, say, Twitter or Facebook, there's a developing strand of thought that if I suck all of the data that's relevant to this hashtag out of Twitter, I have got all the knowledge in the world about that particular thing. Because it's all there is. I've got all million tweets. However, what we have to recognize is, and so that in statistical terms, n, the number, the size of the sample, people will say n equals all. I've got all million, 100 million tweets. And the true answer is no, because the people who tweet are a very small, self-selected group. A very, very small proportion of the people who are viewing the tweets. But most people are observers in these sort of social networks. A very, very small percentage, around about one or even less than one percent, are actually actively doing stuff. So you then have to think about, is it really representative. And Santander, some years ago, decided, yes, they will analyze their tweets about their bank to find out when things have gone wrong. But rather than using that as a sign to go hammer the culprit, they would use it as an indicator. Let's go see what's happening. Let's find out what we could, what procedure has gone wrong. 
The other thing that is utterly crucial is becoming very, very apparent is in all of these AI machine learning analytics development and testing teams, you need much, much more diverse groups in your teams than traditionally we have. If you look at sort of Silicon Valley, most of the teams are, or the, in certain terms of the software, are essentially or predominantly white Caucasian geeks. <coughs> and this is not helpful. This is how the two or three different police forces or court services have come up a cropper in their automated bail assessment systems, where there are a whole lot of questions which appear to be independent, but for demographic reasons, essentially ask the question, are you black or are you white? And if you're black, sorry, you can't have bail. If you're not black, okay, you probably have bail. Because of the co-correlation of the answers of all of so many of the questions, like, do you know anybody who's had a brush with the law? Do you know, have any of your friends had a brush with the law? Have any of your cousins or your fam close family or extended family had a brush with the law? It turns out that demographically in the, West, in the UK and in America, typically, if you answer yes to all of those, you probably come from a black type of environment or family. Mostly, not always, but a lot, enough to make it very, very racist as a system. And if you don't have, if you have that sort of group, as opposed to that sort of group with disability, with ethnicity, um, gender, class, almost wealth even, you will miss many of these terrible biases that come out of the data that we have around us that we train our systems on. So we're training these systems with predominantly with data that we humans have chosen or we have made those decisions. It's learning our biases. AI will not deliver the promise of unbiased decision making. We don't know how. We don't know how to even look at the data to determine whether the bias is there or not. and data, represent representativeness, size, scale, composition, algorithms, testing, the whole lot. You need to be very careful, and I would encourage you all when you go back to look out for where AI, analytics, machine learning, all of this stuff is being used, because you need to get your sticky little paws on sorting some of those out for your company. Otherwise, they too will find huge losses of value, reputational loss, and all sorts of other things if you don't get it right. It's bad enough as it is. Mm. Any questions? So you talk about the bias in the data. Yeah. And ultimately, the AI machine learning is to make these decisions based on the data. So when you get these biases, it's come from Data. The data, the evidence, yeah. the experience. So, but no matter what, there's always going to be the outliers. So how do you deal with the outliers? Well, you have to be careful. I mean, outliers are interesting. If you look into a different area where maybe you're not in the sort of PI sort of work, but you're in, say, IoT type work, you've got two problems. One is when the sensor reads wrong, which is, you might call it an anomaly, and an outlier is where it's a, the sensor is reading correctly, but it's so far out, it's sort of two or three standard deviations away, and detecting both, either or both of those is kind of interesting, because that one is real, that one is wrong. And so you've got problems if you're using sensor-based information in, in space, the real problem there. But in all these other things, it's very difficult. So like, ultimately, like the Amazon example, ultimately they, before the AI system, they would have had the interview process, and yeah. out of that, they would have hired men. Yeah. And so, so, like I say, one in a thousand women might be better than men, but how do you get the AI to say, without, without interviewing all 100% of the women, just to find that? Well, one? you can't do that. I mean, this was just to, not to do the interview, but to produce the short lists. Yeah. That, that process was to you know, get thousands of applications, they want to be able to cull them, and that's ha it's happening now. And some of you may be applying for jobs online, and 
the applicant, the job spec says you need to use, say, SQL. If you use the full expanded version of SQL in its name, what is it? Uh, structured query language, it will reject you because you haven't put in SQL. It's that stupid. And there was one or two examples I've seen recently where a guy, for 30 years' experience, met every single criterion that he thought it'd be useful to expand the structured query language, rather than SQL, to show he understood it. <laughs> Boom! Not on the short list, doesn't mean to. Uh, that's happening an awful lot now. HR is going great guns into this um, approach of mechanizing and then e using analytics to try and filter out who to uh, interview. And they're losing an awful lot of good applicants because the filters and the technology is just so ropey. Will it get to a point where they'll have to accept? Because if you, cause if, like I said, you get them filters so drilled down, they will just put it in mind. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's really interesting to see whether actually they will sort of realise that this is actually not a good idea. We'll go back to the human process because it's more effective. We'll actually catch some better applicants. I, th I mean, uh, personally, I think we're on to getting towards the end of the third hype cycle of AI. That is gonna it's, there are so many examples of failing at the moment and not delivering the promise because we haven't had any fundamental mathematical or statistical insights in 30 years to move us forward. All that's happened is we've got Moore's Law in both communication speed, volume, and CPU. That's all that's making this stuff work at the moment, at all, or feasible, should I say. It's not making it work, but we haven't had any insight to move it on to the next stage. We're waiting for the mathematicians to come up with something interesting, and they haven't yet. So wonderful uh, sessions of work. Uh, quick question on Amazon case study. If we uh, um, let the system learn and unlearn a couple of times, uh, what would be the test to look like after that? For example, any regression test, how would we know whether it learned 30% or learned 70%? How would we do This is where you again have the problem. It's different from what you're used to doing. Um, yeah, you know, what basically you have to be looking at the output and auditing the output to see what's happening. And you have to have enough uh, diversity in your testing team to realize we now need to put through a few female applica applications. See, what does it say about those? And then you suddenly discover that all ten of them have been rejected. And you think, why? And then it will not tell you why, it's just, you have to think, actually you put 10,000 through for the testing here, and three of them were female, and none of them got accepted. Ah, that's the reason it's, and that's why we have to kill it, and then try, and then retrain it with cleaned up data in some fashion, if we can get around all of the problems of the data. Or we just say, it's not feasible, it will be genderist. It will follow the decisions of the humans who provide all the source data. There is no fundamental solution to that. You can't change the algorithms. Because they are to learn. That's all we do. I think lunch calls, folks. Thank you very much.